This is InfoSec Decoded number 75, Patching Feds. And we're starting with Caitlin, who has a problem with Windows 11. Right, so Microsoft 11. Uh, apparently, some of the apps are already completely breaking, completely unusable, uh, because apparently it's shipped with a certificate for some of the applications that expired October 31st. Uh, very fitting that it's Halloween. Uh, suddenly, everything is now dead. <laughs> Well, the code signing certificate expired and Something they actually forced code signing because none of that's been true in the past. Right. Well, apparently there is something with the, the way that some of the software was signed. Yeah. Um, and it expired October 30th. I'm sorry, not October 31st. And therefore things like a few programs like the emoji panel and the touch keyboard, which is important for accessibility, uh, no longer run without another update. Well, um, you know, at first I didn't care about this. Now I do care because in my classes, you know, we, we mess with code and show that Microsoft Windows totally ignores code signing. So what the hell? Besides, I also know you can sign something and then when your certificate expires, it doesn't matter. It goes by the signing date. Right. So so now I'm thinking, I don't understand what this means at all. I, I don't know exactly. Like I said, the, the article doesn't go into too much detail about what, exa yeah. what exact... Certificates failed, um, but it's all on Microsoft's software. Uh, and yeah. so Microsoft might sign its own stuff a little bit more differently than, than third-party applications um, and enforce it with their own stuff. I don't know. But uh, there are certificates on the operating system attached to these programs, and they have failed. And therefore, a bunch of tools are not working correctly. And more importantly, the snipping tool, which is very important if you're doing any sort of red teaming and blue teaming and you have to take screenshots on windows and you did this all the time in your work the snipping tool is super important uh it cannot run at the moment and there is no quick fix it won't even be, it won't even be patched in the next update so uh, microsoft is saying we'll just use the print screen use paint for the you know that's what i always use that is the most stupidest thing right. I, never why, I never even had the snipping tool do you just use print screen it's right. I mean, I mean, but I mean, the thing that, that really brings this, I mean, I, I love the snipping tool. If you're, if you're not using the snipping tool, I, I highly recommend switching to that. Um, well, not but, right now. But not right now. Once, once they fix this. But I think this brings up a larger issue. When we start putting certificates on like everything, it becomes very difficult to keep track of all the certificates, right? On like, if you have a large organization and you have like a gazillion certificates to sign, you know, all the software running, you know, how do you keep track of it? It's hard. And Microsoft is learning the hard way that, you know, all these expiring certificates uh, can be a problem if they're not properly managed and maintained in, in, a, in a way that, um, you know, they keep track of all the thousands and thousands of certificates, which is, yeah, I don't know. It, it's hard. Um, yeah. But well, yeah, now Windows is broken because of it. So I know that's why they, uh they retracted the recommendation for keep certificate pinning in Android. They said, it sounded like a good idea, but when you actually find out what you have to do to keep it, make it work, it's not such a good idea. Right. And also you, you really do need to, you, you should use certificate pinning for very important things. You know, like if you are running something like a, a, a dongle that keeps track of some a user's location, that a user could use as you know spy on someone's location, you should use certificate pinning to make sure that you know no one can steal that data. But if you're just a normal web app developer and you're downloading the the latest um, news updates for your app, you, you really should not be using certificate pinning because yeah, you'll run into problems like this where your stuff will just break. Yes, all right, and it lives. So you want to talk about the uh, treasury? Uh oh yeah let's come back and if that's okay oh yeah okay you're you're hardly uh you're all garbled and broken up anyway you might need to reboot something all right let's go on to urban who's got side loading well I, which i must say i think apple is right here but go ahead uh well apple is saying doom and gloom if side if side loading happens then it's just the end of the world and uh, there's the fourth uh horseman of the apocalypse well, I think they're right. I mean, that is the main reason why Android is full of malware and Apple isn't. I, I tend to believe that. Don't you? Eh, 
I mean, I would like to have a little more freedom to install different things. But like, we don't have any hacking tools on iOS. That's right. My knowledge, they all were kicked out a while ago. That's right. This is what you want. You don't want any of that stuff on your phone, right? There's no malware on your phone either. It seems like a good trade to me. If you want that junk, use Android. <laughs> I'd like the door to be open and for me to open when I want. Well, you, thing, you can't I mean, install, you can develop your own software and you can install it like in like a test version, like up to a hundred installs. That's allowed. That's supported. It's pretty hard to do though. Right, Caitlin? I was going to say that the problem is that this is tied to Apple's monopolistic practices. So yeah. it's a little hard to take them at face value when they say, oh, it's all about security. Oh, by the way, you have to get all your applications to our store, yeah. you know, and give us all your money. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Apple. 30% yeah, okay. cut. Yeah. Sounds fine to me. It works fine. The end result is there's no malware on the iPhone. Uh, very funny, Sam. Oh, there isn't any hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You don't believe that? I just, no. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I do. You don't have to worry about malware. There's no antivirus. You can't put it on. There's no firewall. You don't need it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There you go. No firewall. No, no, no. And you know, yeah, anyone could go wrong. On. And there's yeah. never, there's never been an incident of like spreading malware like there is on Android or Windows on the iPhone. There's targeted attacks, but it really is much cleaner computing environment. I mean, if if you was if. If you ignore all the bugs in the in the applications and you ignore, the, right? You know yeah, all, all the, the, stuff, days the fact that anyone yeah. can post anything and there's probably a bunch of, of malware on the on the app store we don't know about. I mean, sure. I mean, there, if you ignore yeah, all that, there there yeah. has been iOS malware. There have been, and they take it out of the store promptly, and it doesn't affect very many people. I disagree with you people having a bad attitude. The total amount of, of malware in the Apple iPhone system is really much less than Windows or Android. But and then it, Android, Android, if you use their, their store only, you would assume they would have the same amount of malware. No. In fact, their store is completely full of malware. There's unbelievable repeated uh, excesses of people downloading like 100 million malware from a store. The Google does not clean their store the way Apple does. And you assume that Apple knows how to, how to find all the malware and stuff on their store. Well, I mean, I think the point stands that there's definitely less than Android and Windows. But yeah. then again, that's not a hard act to follow because there's a whole lot of oh, it's malware. I think most people can use an iPhone for years and they never have any problem with malware. And that is emphatically not I, true with Android and Windows. I have a huge problem with adware on, on my iPhone. Really? A bunch of my, my stupid applications are sending data out without my knowledge or with supposedly without my, my oh, permission oh, well, or knowledge. That. Of course they spy on you. They're totally spying on me. They're totally oh, well. grabbing. I mean, and the only reason I know this is because I intercept the traffic between the phone and the internet. So I can look at what's going out and I can totally see that this stuff is, you know, downloading God knows what and downloading scripts and running the scripts. I mean, it's no, this is okay. not... Well, that would right. explain your attitude. This is like going to look in the wrong room in the, at the restaurant you go to. You, you, you looked under the lid. Okay. And then ignoring the fact that I've, I've, I've seen firsthand how easy it is to hide malware in legitimate looking applications, mm -hmm. even, if you, even if you can review the source code. Yeah, yeah, it is. But all right. Well, anyway, that's Apple's claim. And... Uh, Doom and gloom. Yeah, doom and gloom. Well, they're saying they must let them have their monopoly in the store, which I, I would vote they should continue to have their monopoly in the store, but lower the fee from like 15, 30% to 15%. But anyway, um, all right. And where are we? I think we're down to Alan with the NSO group. Oh, this one's important. Yeah, we've been talking about the NSO group quite a lot because, well, they've been implicated in a number of... Uh, hacking attacks yeah. against um, political targets. It's uh, the NSO group's Pegasus mobile uh, hacking tool has been a favored instrument by a number of repressive governments for Which, monitoring. By the way, counts as malware on the iPhone. Now that we start bringing up the That's topic. right. Speaking of malware on the iPhone, this is legitimate malware on the iPhone. This is yep. real malware on the iPhone. Yeah. And they do seem to be one of the world's top purveyors of um, 
targeted hacking tools that have been used against journalists, political dissidents, and figures who are otherwise unpopular with repressive governments. And um, the Biden administration has finally done something about this, and they've added the NSO group to the entity list, what's called the entity list, for the NSO's uh, malicious cyber activities. It's uh, not just the NSO group, it's, um, it's also Positive Technologies, which is located in Russia, uh, the Computer, Computer Security Initiative Consultancy, PTE, located in Singapore also, which I've never heard of either one. And then also Kandiru, which is uh, another Israeli uh, hacking company. Mm -hmm. So uh, this doesn't mean that any of these companies are going out of business exactly. It just means that U.S. companies are not allowed to sell any hacking technologies to them. Um, well, you can't sell zero days to them. Right, they exactly. So this now means that zero days are forbidden. So you can't sell zero days. Well, do you how think- How many zero days were being sold to the NS group, NSO group by Americans to begin with? That's what I wonder. I mean, do you really think the Israelis need to buy zero days from Americans? I kind of doubt it. Well, the NSO group does, does pay. Yeah, they okay. pay and they pay well. They pay up to a million dollars plus for um, a single zero day. All right, but no more, except you'd have to do it illegally, which I don't, right. which I think is uh, not going to change the market that much. Probably not, because that whole zero day trading world has been very shady from the start. Yeah, you just get paid in Bitcoin or something, and yeah. hope Uncle Sam will never know. Right. But at least the Biden administration is doing something about it, which I think can only be considered a good thing. Yeah, yeah, probably is. All right. And then I've got a similar one. Uh, the Biden administration has decided that instead of just every year auditing the federal government service and saying that they're 99 percent out of compliance and doing nothing about it, now they actually have to patch it, which is a radical new thing. You have no 60 days to patch like the top 100 bugs that you need to patch that are actively exploited, which is pretty impressive, requiring that they all do that. We're going to see what comes of this. Now, I think most government agencies can't possibly really do that in 60 days, but still, it is a whole new thing that they actually should do something about the vulnerabilities instead of just enumerating them and, and carrying on with as before. So we'll see what happens. I was thinking if I was a government agency with out-of-date servers and untrained out-of-date staff, and they told me to fix all these vulns, there'd be no possibility of updating my practices. The only thing I could possibly do would be to buy a device like a web app firewall and stick it in front of it all. But anyway, um, that may improve our security posture. We'll see what comes of it. I would imagine what's going to come of it is a bunch of them saying, you have to give us more time, like five years, maybe. Anyway. It might also mean a hiring bonanza for contractors who are brought in to fix these problems. Yes, I think they would have to hire a contractor and the contractor would have to buy a bunch of security hardware and plug it in. It's the only way you could possibly comply with this within 60 days. You can't possibly go through all that legacy code and remove the bugs in 60 days. Anyway, so and Liz has got uh, the treasury buying data. And you're on mute, I think. Yeah, so uh, this was a pretty interesting article in The Intercept uh, about how um, the uh, Treasury Department is um, starting to, uh, the Treasury Department and the IRS are starting to utilize these kind of creepy um, third party uh, companies, which um, essentially compile data on people uh, via Apple, various applications that they're using uh, on their smartphones and then sell tracking and location data to the government. So, um, and then another aspect of this is that they are uh, scanning um, social media platforms to uh, analyze users' posts and then go after uh, tax discrepancies. Like if a person made a post referencing, hey, I just got a new $10,000 contract uh, today and then 
didn't pay taxes on it, then the IRS will go over after them and say, but you said you could just got another $10,000 contract today. Where's our money? Hmm. So um, yep. this is pretty slippery slope here. Uh, one of these companies, um, I believe it is, uh, uh, it is called Locate X, um, has already gotten faced some heat over this. Uh, because they were selling um, location tracking data to the government uh, that was harvested from a, um, a popular uh, Quran app. Uh, so they were essentially using it to track Muslims then oh. saying, oh, these people might be a threat. So we're gonna track these Muslims and same company. And, after they got in trouble for that, the government got caught heat for that. They sort of doubled down on this position and found a bunch of other ways in which they could uh, utilize this uh, tracking data. So, um, you know, the this is the, the biggest thing that jumps out to me at this is that, you know, they're still sort of continuing in their pattern to, um, you know, put the bulk of their re re uh, enforcement resources on uh, collecting small amounts from, um, as Leona Helmsley used to say, the little people who <laughs> we, we've pretty much given up on uh, people who are uh, shirking millions and billions of dollars in uh, tax obligations, but uh, let's definitely double down on um, the working class. <laughs> so that's that's uh, <laughs> that's that's not great news. But what is good news is uh, the next story, which is uh, entitled "Self-Driving Farm Robot Uses Lasers to Kill a Hundred Thousand Weeds an Hour." I thought this was awesome. A self-driving lethal robot with weapons. What could go wrong? Exactly. I mean, you know, it, it, this could, this, <laughs> especially when we consider uh, how all of the, the tractors and farm equipment are like totally hackable. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, but it is uh, a really cool concept in that they, th this could be the answer to Roundup right here. Um, instead of using, dousing our, um, dousing our, our farmland and horrific uh, chemical herbicides, uh, they can use this laser enabled tractor uh, to <laughs> annihilate the weeds. And you, and you see this as safer and better somehow. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there are trade-offs, there are trade-offs, but uh, you know, I, I, I think I'd rather eat produce that was uh, weeded um, with lasers than uh, glyphosate. And they've got to do something because yeah. according to this article anyway, um, which the stat is taken from the um, head of the, the robot laser tractor company. So take that with a grain of salt. But uh, uh, according to them, the if they do not weed the crops, they lose about 40% of their yield, which is significant. So well, you've got to weed your crops, of course. Yeah, if we could get away around using these horrific, uh, horrific chemicals uh, to um, do that, then I think that would be good. And then, um, you know, just another plug, maybe if we didn't do our uh, our corporate farming monocropping that destroyed the land, maybe, you know, try rotating some crops, that would help too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And besides, um, the, the self-driving AI with the lasers has a lot of other fun uses, so. <laughs> I'll bet it does. <laughs> and not at all a fire hazard. No, right. no. <laughs> Well, and I think about, I grew up in farm country, so uh, I, I've known about a lot of sort of horrific farm accidents with farming equipment. You know, there, there are people in my life who are missing uh, uh, appendages, and uh, I'm like thinking here, you know, <laughs> this, this could be a lot worse than uh, getting eaten by a combine. <laughs> Yes, uh, a, a hey, mad this... robot tractor, uh, laser enabled robot tractor run amok. <laughs> I saw somebody on Twitter posting like he is missing fingers from the snowblowers in Milwaukee. And my dad had his fingers all twisted from a snowblower. 
these are common farm accidents. You know, those damn things are dangerous. And they're always jamming up and fouling up. And I remember dad cut his leg open with a chainsaw one time and walked like a mile back from the woods and everything. And uh, you did, this happened all the time. We were always getting hurt on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Now you can do it in new and novel ways. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like city life is better, less, less harmful. I yeah. wouldn't, I, I, there's much less suffering, which is a big problem I've noticed. That's yeah. right. You don't develop character. Right. All right. So uh, the astronauts are growing tacos. So, R right. Well, now we have space tacos for reals. Um, so the well, ISO, so, so CNET has an article written by um, Amanda Kruser. Um, and I don't think I mentioned who wrote the last article. So, the last article, the one about Microsoft Windows 11, came from The Verge by uh, Tom Warren. I do want to give them, them credit. So, this one, like I said, uh, this one about NASA and the tacos is from CNET and it's by Amanda Kuser. Uh, and basically what, what this is talking about is that the astronauts on the ISS grew some peppers as part of an experiment. They harvested those peppers and made space tacos, which I just think is the coolest thing ever. Um, there's no better tacos than a space taco. And this is, this is honestly a, a great use of, of the resources on the space station because tortillas are a mainstay on the space station because you really don't want bread due to the crumbs. Crumbs in space are bad news. Uh, tortillas don't have as many crumbs, so they're used, they have a huge stock of tortillas. Now that, now that they're growing edible food like, uh, uh, like these peppers, the astronauts made themselves some space tacos. So food is evolving. Well, there you go. I, I saw that movie with uh, the guy on Mars growing potatoes or something. Oh, the Martian, yes. Yeah, yeah, similar activity. And, and you know what? They they all drink their own urine and everything. So, I think a lot of cities recycle urine in the in the water supply now. A they they do. It, it, it's they and they should. Um, oh, it's yeah. Just not... I think we're going to have to do a lot more of that. It's yeah. the climate change. Yeah. Just don't don't think about it. Don't don't think about the fact that all the water that you flush down the toilet goes through a, um, uh, you know, through a cleaning system, and which involves a bunch of extra chemicals being put in the water, and then gets recycled back into your your faucet, which you then drink as part of your morning coffee. Well, that's all that ever happened anyway. It just filtered through the ground and ended up in the ground and came back up the well. I mean. It, I mean, I, I mean, it, it's a little more involved when you realize there are giant vats of human waste that yeah. gets processed uh, with the water you're drinking in it. Um, We're just doing an industrial version of the yeah. old low tech solution where you filter through ground and plants and stuff, filter out the stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah anyway, don't. Uh, I, I mean, I actually think plumbing, uh, plumbing, and a large scale. Uh, city planning is actually really interesting. And if yeah. anyone at home does not has not looked into the, like how plumbing works, how sewage system works, um, I totally recommend doing it. Uh, every time I learn something new and it's it's always very fascinating and, and but it is it is rather gross. <laughs> yeah, but but absolutely you're right. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was a kid, people said that plumbers and electricians and stuff were dumb, and that is not true at all. There's a no. in, an intricate structure keeping us all alive in these cities, it's really sort of like a space station. All this stuff has to work. Right. No, I mean, if, if I weren't doing computers, if, if hacking wasn't so much fun for me, uh, my next choice of career, uh, other than teaching, <laughs> would, 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 would definitely be a civil engineer um, designing, you know, sewage systems, electrical systems. That stuff's super important, requires ridiculous amounts of education. They just, if you're working on anything that big and that public, you have to be like certified from here to the moon. And even even regular plumbers and electricians go undergo a lot of training and uh, then have to spend years and years uh, going through, you know, supervised apprenticeships, exams and stuff. It's it's really quite rigorous. They're really they're really engineers, even though our society doesn't treat them as such. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then Irvin's got Cisco with hard-coded credentials again. Again, yes, again. Uh, this has been happening about eight times a year for the last three years. Yep, 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 yep. 
it's something just, is wrong look, at Cisco. <laughs> somebody just keeps leaving these SSH keys and default creds on everything. Uh, so there are a number of patches out with CVEs that are meant to fix all these things on Catalyst PON switches and uh, in the Cisco policy suite. Well, there's a clue that it only happens over Telnet, which also, who in the hell is using Telnet? So I think this is all um, technical debt. I think this is all code from 20 years ago. That's well, that's point. that's on the on the switch. Yeah. The the other one, not so much. That's the the key based SSH. Oh, yeah. Default SSH keys. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, so obviously they have a practice of leaving special backdoor credentials in things, and they haven't managed to educate all their developers into knocking that off. Maybe they all need to go do some farm labor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They can, they can build those robots. Yes. With default SSH keys and tell that keys. That'll yes, be could, great. What could go wrong? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. And Alan has got Iran blaming the U.S. Hmm. Blaming the U.S. and Israel. I think Israel is a lot more plausible, but go ahead. <laughs> Well, Israel and the U.S. have been collaborating on attacks, cyber attacks against Iran for... Against their nuclear decades. weapons, yes. Yes, yes. So this is the, the reflexive complaint by the Iranian government that whenever there's a cyber attack against some critical infrastructure in Iran, U.S. and Israel must be responsible. In this case, apparently, there was a nationwide shutdown of the gasoline station infrastructure. And the gasoline in Iran, which is uh, very heavily subsidized by the government uh, to the point that gasoline is really cheap. I don't know exactly what it's at now, but it used to be around the equivalent of 20 cents a gallon. Um, at any rate, because of the, these attacks, this um, subsidy infrastructure went down and so people suddenly had to pay a lot more money for their gasoline. And so this was uh, extremely disruptive to the gasoline economy in Iran. But you know, They're what, also alleging what would Iran the US is, or Israel was, gain? What, what I mean, why that? would either of us do that? What would either US or Israel gain by doing that? Oh, well, um, this was at a time during, um, uh, on the anniversary of some protests so you think they're going to disrupt their society and they'll rebel against their government because they didn't get gas? Yes. Well, I guess that might be true. But there was also an attack that uh, Iran is alleging back in July of 2020, um, affecting Iran's railroad system and one of the ports. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, take it all with a grain of salt. It could have been somebody else, but... Um, if so, these are some pretty big attacks that uh, have been executed by the U.S. and Israel. You know, these are these are very sizable infrastructure attacks, and exactly the kind of thing that the U.S. when it happens to U.S. infrastructure, the U.S. gets very upset about. So, so you think we're doing it to Iran? It's entirely plausible. I mean, I have no way of knowing. No, I don't either. I mean, it's just okay. I. I sort of hope we'd do something more intelligent than that. This just seems sort of like pointless harassment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. And they don't have any like actual evidence to attribute it to anybody, right? They're just guessing. No, um, yeah. the spokesperson says we are, quote, we are still unable to say forensically, yeah. but analytically, I believe it was carried out by the Zionist regime, the Americans and their agents. Well, they're, they're probably right that, that Israel is their main enemy, although Russia attacks them too. Anyway, well, all right. Anyways, this one I thought is pretty good. Um, there's, if you want to hack into people's accounts, you can rent a bot. They say, in case you don't know how to do social engineering, which I noticed the people calling me on the phone totally can't. Someone calls me, first the woman calls me and hangs up and she finds out I'm here. And then two days later, a guy calls me with a thick Indian accent and says, uh, this is Henry from Calco. And I just hang up the phone. He's obviously fishing. So you have a bot. What you do is you get their credentials from like a credential dump. And then you 
use a service, an advertising service, the kind that the real companies really use to generate those automated messages that you hear. And it calls you and says, uh, this is PayPal. We are verifying your account. Please uh, read the number in the text message into this phone so we can verify that it's really you. And if you do that, you're handing it to the bad guys. But it, it is from, in fact, the same service that they really use, really sounding like them. So this is quite effective. So uh, that's the thing to know. If you use two-factor, don't read that number over the phone to anybody. <laughs> anyway, then uh, Liz has got uh, home lab-grown meat. Yes, perhaps uh, this could be in addition to the space tacos Caitlin was talking about someday, because yeah. this is a sort of a sort of a Blade Runner like story here. Um, a, uh, a, a company that's local to me here in the East Bay is uh, setting up to um, a massive facility, $50 million, 53,000 foot uh, square foot campus uh, called Upside Foods, where they are going to um, uh, start to grow uh, lab cultured meats, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and and I, this is really is a large scale production. Essentially, um, what they do uh, is take some uh, cells from live animals, and it, it doesn't hurt the animals. They don't have to kill the animals or or traumatize them or anything to get these and then um, the, take the cells that they've harvested and then put them in giant uh, tanks and then uh, bathe the cells in glucose, vitamins, and amino acids. And then um, essentially you get like a pile of ground beef at the end of this process. And then they have a more um, complex process that involves using some kind of scaffold uh, to grow either like a steak or a chicken breast or something. So this is pretty interesting. So it really is real meat. It's yeah. made from animal cells. Yep. Yep. So I'm, I'm really interested to see uh, where this goes. It's probably, I, I would assume the environmental consequences are probably less than, than factory farming, like pigs. Far is less. Yeah. It is far more, it is far better for the environment to grow the meat and the animals too. Yeah. But I would think no better for your health because you're still eating meat. That's what I would think, but who knows? I mean, you know, they may be able to, uh, you know, who knows? I could see them being able to tweak this too. And, you know, what? Uh, just, like, just like the nutritional profile is much different on uh, grass-fed beef versus um, factory farmed grain-fed beef, you know, they may be able to, they may be able to tweak the nutrient profile on this stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. And uh, that, so now we're down to Caitlin that has cosmologically coupled compact objects. Correct. So the Astrophysical Journal Letters um, has a, a article uh, written by Kevin S. Crocker, uh, Michael Zevin, Duncan Farah, uh, Curtis A. Uh, Nishimura, and Gregory uh, Tarley, published just recently on uh, November 3rd. And let me read the abstract to you. Uh, so they demonstrate a single parameter route uh, for reproducing higher mass objects as observed in the LIGO-Virgo mass uh, distribution. By LIGO, they mean the, the laser instrument, in the, the lasers that do the, um, uh, measure the, the gravitational waves. Um, anyway, uh, the, I've, it's the laser infrared something spectrometer, some gravitational observation. Uh, anyway, forget the the I what the I stands for. Anyway, so they're using only uh, isolated binary stellar evolution, the binary binary stellar evolution channel. So they're only looking at binary black holes essentially, or massive objects. Uh, the single parameter encodes the cosmological mass growth of compact stellar remnants and exceeds. Uh, the Toman Opperheimer uh, Volkoff limit. So, what does that, all that mean? That means that one of the one of the discoveries made by LIGO and Virgo is that what they're seeing in their results are that the objects that are colliding into each other, that are creating the gravitational waves, are larger than expected. 
And so this paper essentially look, tries to figure out what are some ways that we could explain why this is happening. And not to get too technical, because to be honest, I'm not an astrophysicist myself. I'm not entirely, some of this stuff is a little over my head, uh, but uh, one of the things that they do mention is the possibility that dark energy uh, could actually be absorbed by the black holes themselves and cause them to enlarge, essentially outpacing the rate of Hawking radiation. Now, as a black hole gets larger and larger, it actually emits less and less radiation. Uh, so uh, if it is true that dark energy does get absorbed by the black hole, it could easily outpace the, the rate at which Hawking radiation decreases the mass of the black holes and they end up growing. And the paper doesn't talk about this in too, in too much depth because it's all very hypothetical at the moment. Um, however, uh, this brings up a lot of questions about if this is true, and this is still a hypothesis, this is nothing, nothing has been proven yet, but if this is true, what happens in very deep time, if black holes actually grow over time as dark energy increases in the universe, um, what happens as the event horizon start, starts expanding? And keep in mind that uh, event horizons are not uh, bound by the speed of light. So they can actually expand faster than light. And what happens when an event horizon of a black hole, which is expanding faster than light, swallows up an object? I mean, you wouldn't see it coming, first of all. Um, and then you would essentially be in a black hole uh, where time and space kind of get flipped around so that all future paths lead toward that singularity. But that singularity would be so far away <laughs> um, that could you ever even reach it? I don't know. Um, anyways, it brings up a lot of interesting questions, and I also want to point out that the gravitational wave astronomy that that scientists are doing are yielding these new interesting results. So yeah, so is that in a satellite that gravitational wave detector? No, no. So LIGO and Virgo are actually uh, lasers on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, basically, they have several miles long, several kilometers, I should say, several kilometers long lasers uh, in various parts of the Earth uh, at perpendicular angles, right. um, at different parts of the Earth. So they're not only perpendicular, so you have one at 90 degrees and you have another at 90 degrees and you can put them together. And basically what happens when a gravitational wave goes through Earth, um, it decreases or sometimes increases the, the lengths inside the inside these tubes where the lasers are, are fired. Yeah. Um, now it's very slight. Uh, however, if you are measuring very accurately, you can measure the slight increase or decrease of distances of those lasers and be able to measure uh, gravitational waves passing through the Earth from stellar objects colliding into each other. And these have to be massive stellar objects like neutron stars colliding into each other or black holes colliding. It's a very new type of astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're already getting some interesting results. Yeah, and that's the eye is the interferometry, which is- Yeah, infrapermentometry, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> this, this is related to one I didn't put in, but I thought of putting in. They've decided that you could dive into a black hole now if it was big enough. Right. The little black holes would squish you, but the big black holes, you'd be far enough from the center of gravity when you hit the event horizon that you would survive. So this would be a fun thing to do. Go dive into a black hole and find out what's in there. Of course, one detail is you can never come back right. and you can never send any messages back. So we'll never know what you find in there. But right. well, well, the thing is, what, what's new about this is I, that's kind of been known for a while. If you have a supermassive black hole crossing mm -hmm. the event horizon, you, would, you wouldn't realize anything even happened. Uh, now, the problem is, of course, if it's a supermassive black hole, eventually you are going to start heading towards the singularity. Um, so as I mentioned, time and space sort of flip around in, in the black hole, which is very hard to explain without getting into uh, some very complex space-time diagrams. But essentially what that means is in normal space, we're all headed towards the heat depth of the universe. Right. Um, in a black hole, we're all headed towards the singularity. That's all it means. So, um, and, and I mean that quite literally. So if, let's, say, let's say, for example, you have a spaceship that can go faster than light. It breaks all the laws of physics. You can go faster than light. So a lot of people say, oh, well, you can't go out of, this, out of the singularity or the event horizon because light and space is falling in faster than light. So let's say we, we create a, a spaceship that can go 10 times the speed of light. Can you get out of, a, uh, out of a black hole then? No, you cannot. Why can't you? Because any direction you turn is towards the singularity. 
So yeah. even if, if you could, you know, turn left or right, you're still going to head towards the singularity because all your future points are headed towards that. Uh, so there's no getting out under any circumstances, even with a warp drive, even if, you know, anything, you, you cannot get out. Uh, now what's different, and, and the thing that I brought up is that if you have sort of a infinitely or quasi-infinitely large black hole, and you then cross the event horizon such that the, um, such that the, uh, such that the uh, singularity is so far away, it would take billions or trillions of years to get to, like kind of what happens yeah. Uh, in that scenario. And if the black hole started expanding faster than the expansion rate of the universe itself, does the entire universe then becomes an, a black hole? And then what happens in that black hole? Does that start suddenly, um, uh, you know, invert on itself too? I mean, all, every space-time diagram I've seen shows that, you know, you have the event horizon of a black hole. And then if you kind of go past the singularity on the other side, you have a parallel universe and then you have another black hole and another parallel universe and you know it, it kind of brings up questions is is the universe sort of going into a black hole and then coming out in regular space and then going into a black hole i don't know <laughs> and, and it's hard to see that we ever will know because when you pass through the singularity you destroy all the information yes suppose happens. well you 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 destroy the information on the outside yeah and nothing ever comes back to give you a clue what happened right yeah yeah well that's good stuff all right, and that's, uh, we're here, so we're down to Firefox. That logo is not a fox. Do you believe this? Uh, according to this, it's not a fox. It's Master Shifu, a red panda. Oh, that's that picture looks like a fox. Oh. It looks like a fox, but it's supposed to be a red panda. Oh, well, that's interesting. Right? And But... But who did, who determined this? Is there somebody authoritative at Mozilla to make this statement? Supposedly. Uh, All right. Well, well, that's interesting. All right. It's something that looks like a fox. Then they should have named it Fire Panda. They did not ask my opinion. No, they anyway. did not ask for your opinion. And Alan, I hope you can. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, so I should mention that one of the names of the red panda. Yeah. Is the Firefox. Oh, okay. So that's that's. <laughs> Well, okay, so Firefox is sort of a common name, but technically it's a panda. It's a, it's a panda, yes. Oh, well, that makes sense then. It's Master Shifu. Okay, well, that's good to know. And Alan, I hope you can explain this deer thing to me because it bothered me. It bothered you how? Because how in the world are the deer catching COVID? Well, that's the big mystery. And this is actually the second study that has uh, sampled white-tailed deer populations and found a significant number of them have antibodies to SARS-CoV, to, to COVID. And oh, dear. They don't get close to people. They don't go indoors. So how are they catching COVID? Well, this is, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, first of all, it does not seem to be as lethal among the deer. But after all, COVID is a highly transmissible virus. Um, and it's one of the most transmissible among humans at this point that's widely spread. Although supposedly not outside, which is where the deer are. Right, right. And deer are social animals, but just how much do they mingle across different groups or herds? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, a number of deer in the study that was conducted in Iowa, uh, deer that were killed by hunters and then were sampled by the, the, the uh, DNR, I believe, uh, found that they were infected, previously infected with COVID. Um, and uh, they did genetic sequencing on the uh, COVID among the deers and found that there appear to be multiple uh, zoanthroponotic, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, spillover events. So multiple events in which humans infected deer and then also multiple events in which deer infected other deer. So you really wonder how the deer are getting it from the humans in the first place, but uh, apparently this is happening. I, I, well, I, one thing I, I imagine deer eat the trash we throw away. Perhaps so, yes. So I guess if you get it from eating like leftover food, 
which I guess you might. I don't know. Yeah, although I don't know how frequently deer get into the trash. Oh, pretty um, often. <laughs> do they? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's well, that it. would explain a thing or two. Well, yeah, I, I, I thought it was mostly a respiratory thing. I don't know if you get it from eating somebody else's food, but maybe you do. Yeah, I think that's a considered a secondary mode of transmission. Um, but I remember in the early days, we were all like afraid of touching packages someone else had touched and everything. And then right, they the giant run on hand sanitizer and such. Yeah, and then they said that wasn't really the main thing to worry about. It didn't matter. Right, right. Well, but it, of course, the other thing is this means we'll never get rid of COVID, even if we vaccinate all the people, unless we also vaccinate all the wild deer. That's right. Yes. And, and it's been found in a number of different animals at this point, including cats and dogs and, and minks. minks. Yep. So uh, squirrels. So we can we can assume that uh, now there's an enormous uh, animal or zoonotic reservoir. Well, if the deer have it, I would think the squirrels would have it because they also eat a lot of food that comes from pea humans. I wonder what about birds? Uh, I don't know about birds. Perhaps birds too. Uh, certainly bats. Birds aren't real though. Well, yeah, I, mean, I would think bats and like uh, seagulls that eat scraps. Raccoons. Raccoons are a good candidate. Yeah. Skunks. Yeah. Skunks, yes. That's yeah, a so it's never going away. It's going to be around forever. Um, it's notable that the one human, widespread human um, uh, uh, virus that has been eradicated, smallpox, never crossed over to animals. Yeah. So that's why it was possible to eradicate, completely eradicate smallpox off the face of the earth, a global vaccination campaign, plus the fact that no animals carried it. Yeah, so we'll never get rid of this, but hopefully if enough of us get vaccinated, we can reduce the risk down to a more tolerable level. Exactly. Apparently there were anti-vaxxers during the smallpox uh, vaccine times too, where they would do sort of similar to what our current anti-vaxxers are doing. And they had great protests and uh, stuff about it, which I think is, is kind of interesting. Yeah, there were anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers in San Francisco in the, the 1917 one, just like now. Yeah. All right. And uh, so the last one here is this one I thought was very easy to understand, saying we're going to burn through our carbon budget in 11 years at the current rate, which I think is what we've been saying for decades. We only have so much carbon we can dump before we heat the earth too much, and we're going to hit it. So I think... Um, I heard James Carville had the most sensible attitude about this. He said, look, we're obviously not going to stop polluting the world with carbon dioxide in time. There's no hope in the world. Both the US and China are absolutely not committing themselves to do anything remotely like what needs to happen. China says they're going to go carbon neutral by 2060. And the US is like 2030 or something. And neither of them is even remotely close to what needs to happen. So obviously, we need to uh, accept that we're going to dump way too much carbon dioxide in the air and we need to start figuring out ways to clean it out and compensate for it. That's the only way we're going to make it. We should be vigorously investing now in stuff like spraying uh, particles up high in the atmosphere to reflect the sunlight away and dumping iron filings in the ocean to absorb more carbon dioxide and all that kind of stuff. We're, we have to start doing compensating strategies now. So I think that's going to be a growth industry, carbon capture. I hadn't heard the dumping iron filings in the ocean one. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a big one. There's one where you, there's something where you spray something up in the air and it kicks the carbon and makes it rain down or something. There's a bunch of them and uh, we need to start doing them all. There's another one where you, you send up sort of rockets and you stick like uh, powdered aluminum or something really high in the stratosphere and it floats around for like 10 years and reflects away some sunlight to cool us. That's another good one. There's a bunch of them, and we need to start doing all that stuff. All right. Well, that's it for this one. We'll be back on Tuesday.